Kind of take yeah. me back um, to what was going on at that time in your life. I was a um, freshman going into my sophomore year of high school. Um, you know, I was living at home in Lexington, Kentucky, where I grew up. Um, you know, life was great. I was doing, I did ballet at the time. I was danced for 13 years and um, I was kind of prepping for college, like very much in advance. I was taking extra classes and um, I had just like really just had this passion. I wanted to work for NASA and be an astronaut. And um, that's kind of a big part of my story is just the fact that I was pursuing something so drastically different than music. And I had no desire or passion to do music at all. It was just something that I never really was interested in. Um, I grew up taking piano lessons and stuff like that, but um, I never really had the desire to sing. I just felt like that being an astronaut was like what I needed to do. That was what I was supposed to do. And until my brother passed away, you know, everything kind of changed. And um, so on June 7th, he passed away in a car accident. He died on impact. So he never even made it to the emergency room. And so it was 3.30 in the morning. My sister is, she's my only other sibling. She's legally blind without her contacts in. She comes in the room and she's like, Ann, I can't see outside. All I can see is like some flashing red and blue lights. Can you go downstairs and check and see what happened? And my first instinct was like, maybe Jacob got in trouble. Maybe something happened with someone else in our family. Like I didn't know what it was. And so I go downstairs and I see these six police officers standing in front of our front door and they all look just so sad and devastated. And I remember I was like half asleep and I just kind of was yelling at them and I was just asking them, I said, would you please tell me what's going on? Like what is going on? And they would not say a word. And I was just so devastated and I, I kind of felt a little bit like it might've been what I thought it was, but not necessarily. So then I walk into my my family room right around the corner and I, that's when I see my parents. And that was the moment that I'm like, this is really, really bad. And I could just feel the devastation in the room and my mom, you know, I'd seen my mom cry before. She's like a super emotional person, but I had never seen her in this state and just, just so devastated. And I've never had, you know, I'm not a mom or anything, but I could almost sense, you know, a portion of that pain and just how deep her pain was that she lost her son. And then I go to my dad and that was really what hit me was I had never seen my dad cry in all of my 15 years of life. Wow. My dad's not an emotional guy. And he was just weeping and his head was in his hands and I go over him and I just kind of tap him on the shoulder. And the first thing that comes to my mind to ask, it was this. And I, I said, dad, is he dead? And he looked back up at me with tears in his eyes and he said, yeah, and he's dead. And um, that moment was so sad. It was so hopeless and devastating and just, just made me really think about my life in a just completely different way. And all of a sudden it was like, everything was different. You know, I, I knew that I didn't have my brother anymore. I knew that our family dynamic and everything, our life would be forever different. And I could just sense that. And it was so yeah. sad. And, um, and that was really the moment that I turned around immediately, I faced the doors in that room. And the first thing that comes to my mind to say was, Jesus, I trust you. And I remember this feeling like God had spoken to me and said, and are you going to trust me or are you not? And I just remember like just kind of having this moment of like, and are you going to walk, it, you know, this whole tragedy out by yourself or are you going to lean on God? Like, what are you going to choose for yourself? And I was a Christian. I became a Christian when I was 12. And so, I mean, I fell in love with Jesus. Like I was on fire for him for those first three years. And so I had had that relationship with him. I knew enough about the Bible and his word to know that he was going to use this tragedy for good. And so I knew like, this is my moment to trust him. And a lot of us, I feel like a lot of us Christians or just people in general, like we always say that we trust God, but we never, some of us never really have a moment until maybe like later on in life that we really do have to trust him with our all. And we really do have to put our full faith in him. And for me, like I would always wear a necklace that says, I trust you, but I don't know if I actually ever did fully trust God until it was like this life, you know, massive moment where I actually had to trust him. And so I remember saying those words in that room and then it just felt like this weight was lifted off of me. And I felt, I felt something in my spirit that I knew that I had to keep going. I knew that I had to be the strength for my family to get them through that tragedy. Um, I remember pulling my family in the kitchen after the police left and 
I prayed over my family and I prayed and I just said, God, I don't even know how I prayed this. Like I think back and I'm like, this is crazy, but my mom reminds me of it all the time. And um, I prayed, I really feel like it was the Holy Spirit, but I prayed and I just said, God, thank you for, you know, giving us Jacob. He was on loan from you. Like your Jacob is your son. So thank you for giving us Jacob for the 23 years we had him. And um, it was kind of that moment where in our family's life that changed everything. And we realized like, we have to be okay with this. We have to accept it. We have to realize that God has a plan in it. And that was the moment that changed everything for our family. As we walked out the tragedy, that was kind of our foundation was knowing that God was using it for good and that he was going to, to work everything out in the end. Now you're 15 years old at, I mean, the maturity that, and Mm. the the spiritual maturity, Mm. you, how do you even account for that? I mean, this is the, the same night. I mean, you're, you're, you're talking about processing this that quickly, hearing from the Lord, praying for your family. How do you explain that kind of maturity? You know, I think, um, that's really sweet of you. Um, I, I've always been a little bit like, I feel like I've been a little older than I always have been. Like when I was a little girl, my mom homeschooled the three of us. And so she'd be homeschooling Jacob and Elizabeth and I'd be like making my own cup of water at two years old. Like (laughs) my mom just taught me how to be independent and I've always been independent. I've never really relied on people very much for what I need. I just kind of go do it myself. And my mom really raised us to work hard and, you know, just, we never were just handed things as kids. And so we really, all three of us worked really hard for what we wanted in life and still do to this day. And so I think a lot of that, you know, kind of helped shape me, but, um, I really think it was in that moment of knowing, like, I got to, like, keep going with life. Like, I I got to be the strength for my family. I have to step up here, and I have to realize that this is a part of God's plan. And that kind of matured me in an instant. Like, the second I found out that Jacob had passed away, I actually don't think I've ever shared this in an interview or podcast or anything, but um, the second that, that Jacob passed away, I just felt this almost like this weight of caring, like that I had to be strong for my family and that I had to be the one that like got them through it. And, um, and I don't know why, I guess God just put that on me because that was his part of his plan. But I really was kind of the one that would hold them up when they were down. And, um, and that kind of later on was not the best for me because I had to really sit down and process what happened with Jacob. And in the beginning, you know, I would not cry as much. Like I would not really cry that much at all because I was trying to be strong for my family. I was trying to support them. I was trying to keep them going. And so I think a lot of that maturity just came like the second I found out and I was like, okay, I got to be strong for my family because they're not right now and they need me to help them get through this. Yeah. Now, do you feel like you were able to then transfer that and allow the Lord to carry those burdens? Like, or Mm. did did it start to feel like this is getting heavier and heavier? Yeah, I think, um, you know, I tried to be really positive for a while. And um, and I and then I really feel like we went through a really tough season. He died in June. And then um, October, my dad lost his job and um, we had no income. And we went through a really tough season. And then I fell out of bed and broke my wrist out of all things. Oh. And, you know, just all these like awful things, our house flooded, like all of these financial things and just these, all this stuff happened within six months, like the worst six months that we've ever gone through as a family. And, and after that, I got to the point where I definitely realized like, I got to give this to God. Like, this is not mine to carry. And, and then I felt like kind of with the perfect timing, my, my mom and dad were getting a little better. My sister was getting a little better. And then, um, for about a year and a half, I just was really like kind of buried all of my feelings inside and didn't really talk about it much. And then, um, started really seeking God again and really having him come in and heal me. And I went to counseling and really just was able to process what happened with Jacob. And that was really, really helpful for me, but definitely like had to transfer it to God. Cause you know, that's not ours to carry efforts, but I do think God sometimes will kind of, um, will kind of like prompt you to be the strength for someone in that moment. And so I think it's, it's really beautiful how he does that. Yeah. Now, how did music factor in to all of this? Because you mentioned that you were wanting to be an astronaut. I mean, you started yeah. taking piano lessons as a young girl, but certainly not with this in mind where you're at now. How yeah. did music factor into this whole kind of season of your life? So, um, I, you know, I was taking piano lessons. I knew how to play piano. And I was sitting down at the piano one day 
and this was probably four days after Jacob passed away. Um, and my, just for context, my mom's family and my dad's family has like four or five people that can sing like amazing oh. and wow. like so amazing, like talented, like classical music. Like my dad played piano. My aunt is a phenomenal organ player and my great aunt is my great aunt is too. And a lot of family or a lot of music in our family. So I, we had already asked them to sing at the funeral. We had asked like every family member we could possibly think of. And everyone said, no, like we can't do it. It's too hard for us. We can't get up on that stage. So then my mom comes in the room. I had never sang in front of my mom before, never sang in front of my sister, Jacob, no one, not even friends. And I was sitting down and my mom comes in the room and she overhears me singing. And she was like freaking out. She was like weeping because she was, you know, all these emotions. And I was singing What a Beautiful Name by Hillsong, which was just the perfect song during that time. And um, she said, Anne, we had no idea you could sing. Like, what are, what in the world are you even doing? And I was like, mom, I'm, I don't sing. I I'm literally just worshiping God right now. I didn't even think you were in the house. Like I was kind of upset because I, I didn't want them hearing me sing, you know, when you're like embarrassed as a kid and I'm just like, oh. whatever. Like I didn't really want that in that moment. So then she, um, she asked me if I would be willing to sing at the funeral because they couldn't find anyone to sing. And I was like, I got to pray about it. And so I did. About a, two hours later, I really felt the Lord pulling me towards that. So I decided to sing at his funeral first time in front of anyone. There were 1,200 people there. And it was the most incredible moment of my life, but also one of the saddest moments. Um, you know, I was looking at his casket. I was looking at all these people who had just poured into his life over his 23 years and, you know, family and looking at my parents, just so much devastation. But in the moment, I sat down at the piano, and right before I started playing, I heard God speak to me again. This was for the second time. Um, he had spoke to me that first day that Jacob died, and then this was, I guess, a week later. And um, I just heard him say audibly, "And this is what I'm calling you to do. I am calling you to praise and worship my name. And I will never forget those words. I like It was just so, like, it was in the moment I knew it was from God, and I just— kind of stood there. And then I went into that song and all of my nerves had just, the Lord took all my nerves away. And I felt just the peace of God. And I sang the whole song without crying and got through it and was able to just fully worship God in each of those moments. And then I left that funeral that day, knowing that God was going to use me like in music. Like I just knew that music was where he was taking me. And so it was a really cool, bittersweet moment as I was grieving, but also just like feeling God call you to something is really cool. Like when you know that you're doing what he's made you to do, it's a really beautiful feeling. And so that was kind of that first moment. I was like, this is exactly what I'm made to do. And whatever it is, a worship leader in a church or what I'm doing now, like I knew that I was going to do music for God. Yeah. Now I know that you have done a lot of journaling and a lot mm -hmm. of your songs have come right out of your journal entries, My Jesus, yeah. which is the one that, man, it, it blew up immediately. That was from your journal entry, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. So I started journaling after Jacob passed away. And um, that particular journal was, I would write down every day that God got me through another day because I wanted to prove to myself that I was going to survive the tragedy, that I was going to make it. I was not going to quit. I wasn't going to give up on life, but that I was going to like know in my heart that God was going to use it for good. And so um, then a couple years later, after, you know, that journal and stuff, I looked back into it and was looking through different journals. And I kind of started noticing something that I'd only ever referred to God as my Jesus. I had never said, you know, Jesus, thank you. God, thank you. Lord, thank you. It was always my Jesus. And I just remember like having this moment of asking God, I just was like, God, why is it that I've only ever written my Jesus? And he said to me, and it's because it's the truth. You are mine and I am yours. And we have a personal relationship with each other. And I just remember like that being the sweetest thing ever to know that the God of the universe had a personal relationship with me, that he loved me that much and he wanted a relationship with me. And so then um, a few weeks later, I was in a co-writing session. And then that's where I took that title in and that's how we wrote my Jesus. Wow. I mean, yeah. so much has my happened God. in such a short period of time for yes. you to go from having no intentions of never even singing in public five years yeah. ago to now, you know, having a number one hit and producing mm. touring. And uh, what mm. do you, what do you feel like the Lord 
is kind of saying to you now through through all of this? I mean, you're still very, very young. There's so much ahead of you. But what do you feel like the Lord's mm-hmm. doing in you now? I think there's so many things. I'm honestly looking. I feel like God's just been showing me all the things that he's, all the desires in my heart that he's giving me, like that I prayed when I was like 10 years old and that he's still filling those to me. Like I've never in my life seen anything like it before, but the littlest desires in my heart or the littlest dreams, he's continuing to to give those to me as time goes on. And, you know, I'll be having a hard day or something and then I'll get a call and it'll be like, hey, you can do this, you know, this podcast with this person or, hey, you know, you just got to a show offer to play with your dream artist or, Hey, like all these random things. And I'm just like everything that I've dreamed, didn't actually dream of, but had in my heart when I was younger and people that really ministered to me and meant a lot to me, I'm now getting to work with and I'm now getting to do these things. And, and even not just that, but like, if I'm having a hard day or I just feel like the enemy is just kind of attacking me, like I'll like get a message on Instagram and it'll be someone saying that my Jesus, the song or one of my other songs completely saved their life and they became a Christian because of it. And like, those are the moments that I'm just so honored that I get to do this. And I feel like God's just really been teaching me over and over again to just be continuously be grateful for what he's done in my life. And that's kind of the posture that I want to have for the rest of my life on earth is a heart of gratitude for what God's done. And I think that because of what he's done, I'm able to share, you know, my story with other people and they're able to, to be saved or change their lives are changed. And so it's, it's honestly just such a gift to know that. And um, yeah, it's just, I feel like God has been teaching me really just the importance of that. And, you know, just really like being grateful for all he's done. It's so amazing when you get to step back in your life and kind of look at what he's done in your life and just seeing you just, you can see the faithfulness of God. And it's just yeah. been so cool to be able to see that in this season. Yeah. How do you stay in that that tender space of being able to really hear from the Lord? It's clear from an early age that you were able to really hear and discern the leading of the Holy Spirit. How do you stay in that space now at 20 with uh, success in music and all of the pressures that can come up? come along with that, even in the Christian yeah. music kind of circuit Absolutely. and the attention and the social media and all of those things. How do you fight to stay in that space of really dependence on the Lord, walking in daily humility and looking to him and it being sensitive mm-hmm. to his voice? What would you say to kind of yeah. it really helps you? You know, that's, that's something that some people really struggle with. And there's been moments of that, but for me, I really don't care about any of, of any of it other than serving God. And I'm, I'm sure that's a lot of people say that, but it really is true. You know, at the end of the day, if everything was taken from me, I'd be totally fine with my life as it is. You know, I'd, I really just want to serve God and I really just want to be his child. And I just, I just want to do what he wants me to do. Because if you're living in God's plan for your life, that's the most, you know, precious place you could ever be. And I've seen that in my own life. When I just surrender what I want and give it to God, he always gives me so much better than I could have ever even dreamed for myself. Um, But one of the ways I really try to like stay intentional with God is just reading his word. And my phone, especially with my generation, it's so bad. It's so addicting. (laughs) And I feel like it is for everyone in this day and time, but it can be so toxic for me that I've actually gotten to the point now where I leave my phone in the car if I'm like out at dinner or anything, like I literally have to turn off my phone. Like do not disturb doesn't even work. Like I have to turn my phone off. I want to get one of those boxes that you lock it in. You know what I'm talking about? Like yes. those boxes that you like lock it in because it is just so toxic for me sometimes. And it's just, it's, you know, they say that you're like addicted to it. Like you would be a drug or something in your yeah. brain, you know, it's so bad. And so that's something that I, I really try to do every morning before I start my day I turn off my phone and I open up the word of God and I just talk to God and pray and spend time with him and his word. And then um, I really, one thing I've like always done since I became a Christian, my pastor always taught me this was just talking to God like you would anyone else, like just throughout your day. Like I used, I was raised in a Presbyterian church. And so I don't know, it just like I, for me, it was just always like, you know, proper prayer times throughout the day. But 
then I started to realize like, you can just talk to God whenever you want throughout the day. You can just be in the car driving and talk to him like he's in your passenger seat or, you know, be in, in the middle of a meeting and, you know, be talking to him. And I think there's just something so beautiful about that. And I think that's definitely how, you know, God wants us to be with him because we're his children. He's our father. And we can have that close, intimate relationship where we just talk to God. And I think it's so beautiful that we can do that. So that's definitely a big portion of how I really stay in tune with God is talking to him and um, being intentional. And, you know, it'd be easy for me not to be because I'm on stage telling people about Jesus every night. But I have to be careful because if I'm not filled up myself, then I can't go pour out to people every night. Yeah, no, I, 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 I totally get that. Actually, <laughs> radio has some similar challenges of like, yes, absolutely. You're yes, you have to make sure that you're being filled up. Well, thank you so much for taking the time to do this. It's been a real absolutely. joy. To get to know yes. You a little bit. yes, absolutely. It's so good to meet you. If you'd like to learn more about Ann Wilson, including upcoming tour dates, check out annwilsonofficial.com. Snapshot Testimony is a Moody Radio podcast and short feature. If you enjoyed today's conversation, I'd like to ask you to take a moment or a couple of moments to write a review. Your feedback really helps grow the podcast. And I just like hearing from you. I'm your host, Allie Domerson. Together, we're sharing the moments that shape our faith in Christ.